All right. So I that kind of laid out my objectives to help frame my thinking. Um, just for today, I want to provide you with an overview of couples therapy, just dipping into some of the EFT research, which I think I've already done a little bit. Um, we'll talk about attachment theory and how it really does provide such a, a strong foundation and basis for understanding emotionally focused therapy, but also for understanding love relationships and adult attachment and for understanding why we experience distress in our love relationships and how is attachment theory sort of a roadmap to finding our way back to a secure bond. Um, we'll talk about the goals of EFT, uh, talk about how we understand distress it, from an emotionally focused perspective and how we use that model in our work with couples. Um, I will dip kind of introductory into techniques and interventions and most of it won't be new for you from the um, from the kind of process experiential way that we show up in the room with clients. Um, what will be new for you is just the the map and keeping track of the steps and stages of EFT um, and also there's aspects of the interventions that are just new from the perspective of engaging couples and how do you get couples to um, have kind of a new emotional experience with each other in the room how do you set that up um, and then we'll just discuss and actually gabby had a couple of intakes with couples yesterday so if we have time maybe we can try to apply some of this to just your beginning understanding of what me might be going on with those couples so this is just, we are never so vulnerable as when we love. And that's actually a quote from Freud. But when I saw that quote, I thought, well, yes, right? We can all relate to that sense of vulnerability um, that comes up when we love. But what's so true from EFT is we never feel so loved as when we can be vulnerable. So that's what really we are looking for in change and helping our couples is when we can guide couples toward being vulnerable, experiencing their own emotions, expressing their needs and longings to their partner, um, that, vulner that feeling held in those moments and feeling understood by your partner I think creates an experience for couples that they've never been loved so well. And so that's just what I wanted to bring in. And then you'll notice that these couples are all ages, all, all but diverse races, diverse sexual orientations. One, I think, limitation of the EFT research to date is it's largely been conducted with heterosexual couples. So I think there's a lot more research going into looking at same-sex couples. Um, and also, I think a lot more awareness of, you know, even right now I'm reading a lot more about EFT research with Black couples um, and how we can understand sort of contextually and bringing in the multicultural pieces and awareness to working with different diverse couples. Some of the examples in the EFT you'll see sometimes feel a little bit heterosexually biased. So I always want to bring that in and, and um, talk about that. I like these quotes. I think we're covering up some of the words, but here we go. Um, you know, EFT is an experiential approach. Change happens through a different corrective emotional experience. Probably reminds you of Rogers when I say that, right? Carl Rogers is really, I mean, if you can channel Carl Rogers when you're doing EFT, then you already have, you know, 50% of what is um, important in how we, how we create safety and work with, with the couples. Um, all knowledge is experience. 
everything else is just information. Change occurs in therapy through a corrective emotional experience. It's impossible to create a sentiment of tenderness by any process of reasoning. One thing I found really challenging, I think by nature I'm an insight-oriented therapist and um, sometimes really eager to share my interpretations with clients and love to share my understanding. But I think I notice when I get stuck with clients, I become almost like a teacher. I wanna do a lot of psychoeducation. And I'm bringing that up in case you notice that for you too, because there's a lot of excitement when I started learning EFT. And I think sometimes I was excited to deliver that to clients in a way that was probably not that helpful for them. I mean, on the one hand, it can be, help, it can be helpful to just know that your therapist understands you, um, but that's not what leads to change uh, is explaining to clients what's happening. What leads to change is, is guiding the clients toward different ways of being together. So I say that to try to like, you want to take in all the knowledge. You want to understand all the theory. You want to hold the map. But it's not about teaching the clients the map. It's about guiding them to their destination. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I just like to say that up front and just Repetition is part of EFT because we all need to hear the same thing over and over for it to sink in. And so I may, I may say that a lot, but it truly is an experiential approach and change happens experientially. I think, you know, the other thing is while part of your training is to develop expertise as a skilled couples therapist, you're also human. And I find that um, I you know, use myself as a tool, we all do as a therapist, but because I can draw from my own experience of, and my own love relationship, that it, it's very easy, I find, to empathize with couples because we're all in the soup together. We've all experienced moments of disconnection. We've all had attachment fears come alive. We've all had bad and ugly moments with our partner. Um, and hopefully, you know, the training you have this year will impact your relationship um, in ways that, you know, I think are sort of transformative for us as therapists. But um, I think it's so important that our humanity comes through, you know, that that it's not so much important we're showing up as experts with our couples, but we're showing up first as human beings that understand the experience. Um, and so that's it's like an important thing to hold on to. And you'll learn a lot this year if you can bring in your own awareness of kind of roles you take in your relationship and your own relationship dynamics that might come up um, and things that sort of trigger you and you'll start seeing that you know in couples that you're working with as well so i mentioned that eft is pretty much put out as the gold standard approach to working with couples there's been so much research validating the efficacy of eft You'll notice if you really dive into the EFT outcome studies, they're using an outcome measure called the dynamic adjustment scale. Um, I routinely have Valerie send the DAS to couples just so that you get familiar with that measure. Um, it's not necessarily developed for EFT per se, but it also gives you a broader view when the couple's coming in on some of their struggles that they're experiencing in their relationship. Um, it might be interesting as we go through the year to kind of routinely have couples take that um, at the end of their treatment too, so you could see evidence of your own work, you know, um, leading to changes for the couples. What's really um, promising and important is that we're not just seeing couples change immediately after therapy, but we're seeing that that change is lasting. So when we talk about corrective emotional experience, that's 
important that what happens in therapy really changes things at a level that the couples do become more securely connected. And I think what's really important um, is that we are not uh, in the business of uh, conflict resolution to the extent that we're gauging somebody's relationship based on their, the amount of conflict they might experience with each other. But what's increasingly important is that, you know, I use this metaphor of like, when you fall out of the boat, you know how to get back in, right? Repair. And couples learn how to repair relationship ruptures. They learn how to repair attachment injuries with this model um, so that they don't get disconnected and sort of spiral and get stuck in a negative cycle that they really can't get out of. So we teach them how to reconnect after moments of disconnection. We can't teach someone never to have moments of disconnection. It's just not possible, right? It's inevitable that we're all going to have bad days. But how do we find ways to reconnect and not let our bad days become ugly um, and really sort of feel like we're becoming unraveled in our, in our relationship? Um, The other thing that they've looked at is generalizing the effects of EFT across different kinds of clients and couples. Um, so depression, anxiety, lots of research on PTSD and trauma, still finding consistently positive results. You know, I will say that most practicing EFT therapists are sort of like eight to 20 sessions doesn't always fit. So if you're, you know, 20 sessions in and you feel like you're still, you're still doing, you know, stage two, early stage two work, that's okay. Because the research is usually sort of ruling out a lots of uh, comorbid clinical diagnoses that could be complicating treatment or other things. Um, so uh, sometimes the work is longer term, but all the research is looking at, you know, couples therapy done fairly short term, and these changes are, are huge and significant. One of the studies that I actually, like, found really powerful was a study that looked at the experience of pain and how it changed when we, we were feeling soothed by our partner. This study, I'll show you a video of Sue Johnson actually introducing the research, but they looked at couples that were experiencing distress who then came in for EFT therapy. And before the distress, they would have one partner um, in an fMRI and they were looking at their brain reactions to, um, to the onset of pain. Um, when a couple was feeling disconnected, the person experiencing pain would actually experiencing it most, more profoundly than after EFT therapy, once they felt more securely connected to their partner. If their partner was holding their hand post-therapy, their experience of pain was diminished. And it's just so important when we look at, I think, the critical importance of secure relationships for our mental health our, you know, and our physical health, actually, and we'll talk about some of that, um, and how soothing it is to have the comfort of a partner that you're securely connected to. And so I often say to couples, life is hard, right? It's, there's a lot of suffering in life. There's a lot of pain. And I think when I was talking to one of you, I said, when we're in a dark place, you know, if I'm in a dark room, I don't necessarily need my partner to come in and turn the light on. And that's not even possible, right? And that's the, look, life is hard and painful, but I want them to sit next to me in it. Sit next to me in the dark. Because when we experience like we're not alone, it's so comforting. So that feeling of, boy, we do hard things together. It elevates our ability to show up and cope, um, decreases depression, anxiety. Um, we're less likely to have physical illness um, so that we become more resilient and more immune. So this work is, I just, I think, I can't think of anything more important 
right, on our mental and physical and psychological health. But I'm going to show you a video. Um, you should be able to hear it because I've given you access to my computer um, audio, but let me know if you're having trouble hearing it. So Jane and Carl seek out Emotionally Focused Therapy, or EFT. Before their first therapy session, Jane lies in an MRI machine for a brain scan. She signaled that a shock to her ankles might be coming. Alone in the machine, her brain lights up like the 4th of July sky, and if and when the shock comes, she reports, it hurts. When a stranger holds her hand, the results are the same. When Carl holds Jane's hand, her brain activity again indicates real alarm and she says the shock is painful. Contact with her husband does not soothe or calm her brain. After Jane and Carl's last therapy session and bonding conversations, Jane is again alone for the fMRI and her brain lights up when she sees the X indicating a shock is coming and the shock hurts. When a stranger holds her hand, her alarm response and her pain are a little less. But this time, when Carl holds Jane's hand and she sees the X, there's a powerful difference. Niddle brain activity indicating any kind of anxiety or threat can be seen. The loving contact she now perceives from her husband's touch changes how her brain encodes this threat and she reports that the shock is just uncomfortable. Now that is interesting. In fact, these kinds of results make us forget that we're academics and stuffy old researchers and remind us how to do a touchdown victory dance with the best of them. But what does this study, especially the brain scan part of it, tell us? First, that when we make sense of love, we can tune into the attachment channel and shape loving feelings in therapy. Yes, you can evoke this mysterious thing called love just by talking in a new way, a deeper, more emotional way with each other. And when we shape this connection, we can change the way our brains respond to threat and pain. Love is a safety cue that literally calms and comforts the neurons in our brain. Second, these results support all the new research on adult love and bonding. They confirm that secure bonds offer us a safe haven from the perils of life and a respite from anxiety. Not just when we're two or three years old, but as adults. The quality of these bonds then have profound implications, not just for happiness, but for mental and physical health and our ability to face life and its uncertainties with poise and grace. This is just the beginning of the new science of relationships. Is there anything more important for us to understand and shape? We all fear facing life alone and we all long for loving connection, a hand to hold that changes our world into a safer place and soothes our brain. This reminds me of a saying by Jackson Brown. Life is slippery. Take my hand. Cool stuff, isn't it? Um, well, you know, I think something that really strikes me is as psychologists, we sometimes talk about codependency um, and it's now in kind of popular culture, the idea of like, it's not okay to be codependent. And we can sort of look at like levels of codependency that may be unhealthy, but what, what EFT teaches us and what attachment theory teaches us is there is such a thing as healthy dependence. And in fact, that as human beings, it's, we are we are wired we are bi biologically wired for connection that having sort of dependence is in fact what helps us become independent 
it's like the dependency, it's like the paradox of dependency. Once we feel securely connected to the person we turn to for love and comfort, when there's that secure bond, we have unlimited potential to thrive in our professional life, in our personal life, in our physical and psychological well-being. But when that connection is disrupted, we become preoccupied with that need for love and connection. And that we may act in ways that sort of get us caught in kind of negative patterns. So we'll talk a lot more about that. But I think that if you're, if you're really buying into this model, then you would agree that there's a level of dependence that's very healthy. And that a lot of couples come in um, and are quite reluctant to turn to their partner for that soothing support and comfort. And it may be that they've learned from a young age that they need to cope on their own or they turn away from their partner to other activities and things to find comfort. Um, but so sometimes we're like guiding, guiding people to know how do, how do they even know what they need? And sometimes people can articulate, they don't even know what they need. They don't even know what they feel. And they don't know, they've never asked for comfort because getting it maybe wasn't an option when they were growing up. So, so much of what we do in therapy is really guided by attachment theory. So I do want to talk about attachment theory um, and just basically, because I know you guys are familiar with Bowlby and Ainsworth and some of the early attachment research, but also talking about how it's been applied to adult love relationships. Um, so often you'll hear me say a lot, like the map. <laughs> Uh, that we have a roadmap um, and when you are when you're feeling lost or unsure of where to go in therapy just take comfort in knowing stick with EFT right stay with the emotion stay with the process um, and we'll we'll help kind of guide you through those steps but it's comforting to know that attachments perspective does provide a map because attachment theory has taught us about what a securely attached relationship looks like. Um, we understand a model for a secure bond. And so much of that actually came from Bowlby's early research. Because believe it or not, I mean, this was the 1950s. There wasn't sort of a recognition about the importance of relationships and bonding at that point. So it was pretty revolutionary. It was like post-World War II, John Bowlby actually was studying these uh, orphan children who were experiencing psychological distress and dysregulation, physical ailments, and really beginning to kind of conceptualize the negative effects of being, um, you know, basically like taken away from caregivers and not being held, not being nurtured. So it sort of began to question what was going on there. Um, and that really gave rise to this new understanding that, you know, as human beings, we are biologically wired for connection. And not only was that the case, but we could actually understand distress and attachment distress based on um, understanding kind of the quality of the early relationships between caregivers and, and infants. Um, so what, what stands out is Bowlby's research was largely looking at relationship between mother or um, you know, primary caregiver and infant and the recognition that you know, a secure relationship is really one in which the infant experiences the caregiver as consistently warm and dependable and trustworthy. Um, and we know that, you know, it, it doesn't have to be consistently perfect in 100% attunement. And all the research kind of shows that we can have a secure bond when we experience our partner or our caregiver as attuned like 30% of the time, which is always comforting for mothers who often feel a sense of guilt that they're not doing it well enough all of the time. We don't have to be perfect all the time. 
but we have to get it right. We have to sort of attune um, at least 30% of the time for to be experienced as, as can, dependable and trustworthy. So all this early research, and you know, Ainsworth worked with Bowlby and began to identify different attachment styles. So that comes into play in terms of just understanding that while some of us as adults really have benefited from good nurturing, good mothering, um, and that has resulted in us experiencing both love relationships in a way that allows us to have a positive view of ourselves, right? So we talk about attachment as developing working models. We kind of internalize expectations of ourselves and others based on our experience. That just makes sense. If we've experienced warmth, consistency, dependability, trustworthiness, we're probably gonna go out into the world and expect that from people. It's gonna make it easier for us to lean into relationships, to trust others. We may be less reactive to signs that a person is unavailable because we believe that overall they care about us. That's internalized, that's secure, that comes from a secure attachment style. We may also have view of ourselves as lovable um, and trustworthy and you know, dependable and all of those things that we expect people will, will love and nurture us and that we deserve that. So that's secure attachment. You know, we also see anxious attachment and Ainsworth's research was so important in understanding how a, a child would develop an anxious attachment style where they may be reactive to signs of a caregiver being unavailable, which largely comes from experiences growing up when we experience caregivers as inconsistent, independable, um, maybe neglecting, um, not warm. And so again, working models, we may develop expectations of other people of maybe they're really not going to be there for us when we need them. And we may even become reactive to signs that, that we are not wanted. We may become more sensitive to things that feel like rejection, uh, disappointment, and that's where you see people um, in the case of a, an anxious attachment style, often kind of reacting strongly to percep perceived rejection. Um, and then we have uh, examples of people who may be more dismissive um, and very reluctant to get close in relationships. So, you know, we kind of use that attachment theory as understanding we develop working models of attachment that can be sort of latent, you know, but they do get activated in times of stress. So as adults, when we experience, you know, like distress with our partner, those attachment models get activated. Those expectations come to the forefront and we start reacting to those things. I think for a lot of people, I use sometimes parenting examples because if you're working with a couple that's like, that are parents, they can easily relate to the idea that their you know, young children need their physical presence in order to feel secure. And that's generally true. Kids really seek out their caregivers for reassurance and security. And you see that, you can observe that all the time, right? Like, oh, if mom's right there, I'm okay. Now I can go off and play with my friends. I have this sense of security. That's kind of tethered at times to physical proximity. As adults, we don't need physical proximity because we can internalize our partner. When we feel loved, and I'm sure you can conjure that up, right? It's like those days where maybe you've had that really like bonding experience with your partner boy, like you feel like maybe you can take on the world, right? It's like they're, they're, they're somewhere else and you're where you are, but they're with you. Um, and so there is that quality of like being able to feel comforted by our partners when uh, in having that kind of secure, secure connection. So what's important here is understanding that Bowlby theorized that attachment was really important from the cradle to the grave, that because we internalize these working models, they, 
they do predict our patterns and our comfort in relationships as adults. And in the 80s, there was this explosion of adult attachment research and then understanding in particular how attachment styles like secure, anxious, avoidant, dismissive actually predicted um, you know, comfort with closeness and relationships and things like that. So what's helpful for me from an EFT perspective is sometimes just, you know, the view of self and view of other. So in our supervision, I'm more concerned with you connecting with that than, you know, identifying in the attachment style per se, but what does that say about this, you know, couple and in particular this partner's view of themselves and view of other and how is that kind of predicting their reactions um, and what does that tell you about their attachment needs so um, that was pretty revolutionary in the 50s and then th there was sort of some speculation and resistance to the research that demonstrated how important contact comfort was that human beings needed to feel nurtured, held, soothed, and that had huge ramifications for psychological and physical well-being. Um, and Harry, Har Harry Harlow, as you know, did these highly unethical studies now that are sort of like really dis distressing to watch, but we learned so much from these studies because there was like the speculation that these infant Reese's monkeys that were, were basically separated from at birth from parents um, were really only needing sort of like sustenance, right? They just needed food. It wasn't about kind of comfort or nurturing. But what they found was these Reese's monkeys that were separated at birth were like totally decompensating. I mean, they were like in constant distress, they were self mutilating, they were basically refusing to eat and dying, horrible. And then they set up these research studies to look at what would happen for these infant monkeys separated at birth, when they had the option to have a wire monkey with milk versus a terry cloth monkey with no milk. And so the idea was, where would they spend their time? So it was very striking um, and eye-opening to see that what happened was these monkeys would actually kind of snuggle up to a terry cloth monkey for contact comfort. And when hungry would go off and you see this monkey here drinking the milk, but he's developed an attachment to the terry cloth monkey, which is really sort of evidence of that importance of contact comfort. And what we understand, even the fMRI study shows what happens when, you know, we are touched by someone physiologically, it's a, we, we change when we're touched by someone that we have a secure bond with. How comforting and soothing it is to have the presence of someone that we love. So that's pretty profound um, that human beings respond so strongly to that secure bond and so strongly to touch. Um, so all of this sort of becomes the underpinning of, of the, our work as emotionally focused therapists. These are sort of key concepts, which I say a lot. We are biologically wired for connection. It's part of being human. Um, what we know about secure bonds and from infancy is if I were to ask you, how does one develop a secure attachment style? Largely it comes from a caregiver who's been emotionally responsive, available, trustworthy, dependable, warm, but ultimately it's emotional responsiveness. If I experience you as being there for me, then it, I, I'm more likely to feel a secure bond and connection. And that is so critical because you will learn that that is the key change agent in couples therapy, is when you experience your partner as being emotionally responsive. So we'll talk a lot more about what that looks like and how to help couples learn how to be that for each other. Um, Emotional connection, you know, is coded as a safety cue. 
um, our whole nervous system responds in it by being soothed when we feel connected. And what's important to know here is when we experience those moments of disconnection, and let's be honest, you know, you know from your own relationships, it, we are so attuned to our partner's nonverbal <laughs> communication that it could be a slight you know, looking away, not feeling attended to, you know, eye roll, whatever, that we have a physiological reaction to that. And, you know, it's like, it's just quick. It happens. And it, and it's like where it hurts. Oh, and suddenly our own attach, it's an attachment injury, right? Our own attachment needs get activated. And there's also these attributions that come up. I'm not important to you. You don't care about me. Um, and all the things we kind of tell ourselves. Um, so that's, that's a physiological response to feeling disconnection. And we may read that in many ways in our relationship. So attachment theory tells us the quality of our bond shapes how we see ourselves, shapes how we engage with others, and how, shapes how we deal with stress. So, um, I'll just sort of, I'll, I'll sort of leave that there now, but I, I think that those are the elements of attachment theory that help guide our interventions. And that essentially that roadmap is showing us that we are, we are really trying to bring couples by using the model of secure attachment to learn how to be emotionally responsive to one another and you can't be emotionally responsive to someone who's not vulnerable. So there's one thing about learning to be emotionally responsive. And there's another thing about learning how to be vulnerable and trust that somebody will be there for you and love you and have your back. And that could be hard for a lot of people. I mean, it takes a lot of work from a skilled therapist to sort of orchestrate and guide couples to those kind of um, new ways of being with each other. You'll hear this in EFT, the ARE. There's actually, Sue Johnson developed a, um, sort of a questionnaire that it's true, false, and it's been adapted. I have an adapted version if you ever want to see it. But it assesses um, from, it sort of puts an attachment lens, right? Let's look at your relationship from an attachment lens because we want to understand how you experience your partner and maybe also how you would rate yourself in terms of how accessible you are, how responsive, and how engaged. So if couples are coming in, and let's say you're looking at this couple, and it's like, this question, can I depend on you? Will you be there for me when I need you? You know, if couples are responding to that as yes, you know, I, I can consistently depend on my partner, I feel like they're responsive, then we're going to look at accessibility. Can I reach you? You know, do I matter? If they're saying yes, um, engagement. Are you emotionally present? Do you, sh you know, do you share your feelings with me? Um, those are all indicators that would suggest if a person is experiencing their partner as accessible, responsive, and engaged, that they probably have a pretty secure bond. But most couples coming into therapy are not going to feel like their partner is um, accessible, responsive, and engaged. And then that helps, that sort of begins to explain why they are finding themselves distressed. Because we know that if you don't experience your partner that way, things really start to break down because you don't feel like there's a secure bond. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so what we know about everything uh, about ro uh, romantic attachment is we use the word attunement a lot. Like, how attuned are you um, to your partner's needs? And really, ultimately, is are you experiencing your partner as attuned to your needs? So that's the kind of are you there for me? One of the ways I start therapy in the initial assessment is I ask each person, tell me what you're longing for. A couple of things are going on there. One is I'm using the word longing. That's an attachment frame already. It's like, what do you need? What do you want? 
Um, and it gets them a little bit out of getting into like a content issue, which every couple will bring in, but it brings them into the core of attachment needs. And when you ask that question, you'll start hearing the same thing because all human beings want and need the same thing. <laughs> we want to feel like our partner cares about us, that they're there for us, you know, that essentially like they have our back. There's trust built. Um, and that kind of helps frame goals for therapy as there's, and you might even notice and be able to say, it sounds like you are both longing for the same thing, that you're both very important to each other. You both want to feel like important and valued and um, more connected. So um, we've talked about working models of self and other. I think a, a real game changer in couples counseling for therapists and for clients is reconceptualizing why couples get into conflict. Um, most couples have no idea. They might be able to say, it's like we're having the same argument over and over. They could probably identify with being in a negative pattern. But when you start to put it in an attachment frame, I think it changes everything in a way that breeds a lot more hope for couples. Because what happens biologically for human beings when we feel um, the threat of separation, the threat of disconnection, like that moment when we suddenly feel like our partner isn't there for us. It's not unlike going back to that uh, observation of a child who's lost in the store and they don't see their parent anywhere. They go into distress, attachment distress, which is an adaptive and evolutionary uh, reaction to separation from caregiver. Like it's meant to bring us back into proximity and safety. We don't really think of that as adults, we should feel that, but it's part of being human. You know, we transfer all of our attachment needs from parent to, to romantic attachment. You know, who is the first person you call with good news? Usually it's your partner. They are the, your person. I say that a lot. It's like, they're your person in this world, on this planet. Um, so when your person is like not there for you or you feel disconnected, biologically, we have a really strong response to that, right? The amygdala phew, lights up and we have what, what I call primal panic. So there's a, there's a real visceral reaction and a kind of a panicked response that happens as a result of the attachment distress. Um, and it's kind of like fight or flight, right? And we understand that the nervous system goes into sort of it's activated fight or flight, anxiety. And it's interesting because when you look at kind of ways in which couples will respond in those moments, it does look like some couples turn up the volume and they, they fight, right? So if you're not there for me, wait, you, you didn't call me. I thought we had plans. Like, how come you're doing this again? How many times have I told you that you should call me? Like, this is ridiculous. I'm hostile, I'm aggressive, and I'm angry. My partner's probably wanting to just get pretty far away from me in that moment, even though what I need is desperately to feel more connected and reassured. So it's like I'm fighting for connection. I like that phrase a lot. Is it working for me? Hell no. <laughs> but that's what's going on for me. And my underlying attachment needs are, I'm so afraid that I'm not important to you. But what comes up is my secondary emotion of anger and hostility. So you're going to see that a lot. And we call people who respond that way to their primal panic pursuers. They're pursuing their partner in an attempt to connect. But that fighting for connection usually is pushing their partner away because it's pretty shaming. And that partner, we might be tapping into their own feelings like they're not good enough, they'll never get it right, they're disappointing you. And what we might see is that their reaction is more flight. So we call those withdrawers. So 
But when they feel disconnected and the pursuer comes in this angry and hostile reaction, the shame is activated and they withdraw. So they may experience numbness or sort of get quiet or just retreat. And you can imagine what that does to the pursuer, right? It's like super activating because now it looks like you're validating all my fears. I'm really not important. You don't care. Hell, you're not even upset. But I need you to, I need to know that I matter to you. And maybe you'll all realize that if I yell a little louder, <laughs> I'm going to bang down this door, right? And then you see things get really like escalated. And the pursuer is so angry and hostile. And then the withdrawer is really shutting down and feeling more numb. And what's happening on the inside is both people are in deep distress and they just, they, they don't know how to get reconnected. And that's when we, it can get really scary because people don't know how to get out of that. And people can stay in, in patterns like that for years. Um, and unfortunately, people will often stay there for quite a while before they'll seek out any kind of couples counseling. But I kind of went deeper into that than I intended to, but I, I hope what you're seeing is what we're seeing is that when people are in conflict, it's really just evidence of how important they are to each other. We know that there's a strong attachment and that it's super distressing to feel disconnected and that conflicts are conceptualized as protests to emotional disconnection. And so one of the first interventions, once we understand that cycle, is we, we, we start framing things in that attachment framework for the couple. And they start understanding what happens for them when they feel disconnected. Um, and they start recognizing that pattern. Something I, I don't routinely use this um, next video with my weekly couples, but when I do intensives, I will share um, this video with, with couples and I wanna share it with you. Have you ever seen the still face video with the mother and her infant? Okay. Oh, you have? Right, well, let's watch it and then just talk a little bit about um, what you notice from this video. Maybe aspects you, you relate to and as you think about what I just said about pursuers and withdrawers, um, what kind of comes through. We'll take a little break after this. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In this still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I need my girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this and then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother, she points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Oh, yes. Oh, what a big girl. It's 
it's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly situation.